the type of... Come on, it doesn't work. No. You're trying to come up with nonsensical sentences <laughs> It's so <again>. hard. <laughs> My nonsense. Well, we are on uh, Friday, uh, August 21st, 2020. Although we've never said anything that had anything to do with the date, basically. So even saying the date probably just like dates this unnecessarily because everything we've been saying is for better or worse evergreen, I think. Yeah. Um, we should talk about World War One. Is that what you're saying? I think um, we should talk about music because Patrick and I have become very good friends through this uh, process. And we, I think, share a lot of things in common. But I found out yesterday music is not one of them that you have uh, an absolute inability to even hear music as beautiful or is it just um, what happens when you hear like non lyrics music? Uh, the best analogy I have is like there are people that are face blind and I'm tone blind or uh, I don't know, atonal, tone deaf, whatever you want to use. Uh, music just doesn't enter my brain the way it appears to enter other others' brains. So you just you just you just have an indifference. You never are struck emotionally by it. Very, very rarely. Like I think all the time about what Spotify must think of me and how boring they must think I am. Like I play the same songs uh, uh, over and over. If I find one that I like, I just kind of like it. Um, it's often like uh, m many, many people have told me that the music I like doesn't sound like music to them and I don't even notice. What does it sound like? Uh, I, I, uh, strange sounds. Get a little uh, closer to the mic if you can. Strange sounds in sequence. Yeah. Strange sounds in sequence. Like maybe maybe speech sounds. I like listening to like heavy speech. Right. <laughs> but I mean, I wouldn't even call it lyrical. I would call it speech sounds. So yesterday I was, uh, uh, we were listening up. to, what's that? Could you turn this up a bit? Yeah, I, th I think you should just get closer Not to it or, bring, or move up. it closer to you. Uh, it's no different. Had, it just, yeah, it's fine. It just sounds better when, it, when, you're, when you speak closer into it, I think. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. There's that, yeah. that beautiful radio voice. Oh. Um, Today on. <laughs> but um, yesterday we were listening to my one Spotify playlist that I have a thousand songs on and it goes everything from, you know, hip hop to Chopin to, you know, electronic music. And I like the kind of sh sudden shifts in mood. Other people are, you know, a little more sensitive to that. But then this like Neapolitan folk song came on. And I started translating the words for uh, Melody and Patrick. And I suddenly see uh, Patrick's ears perk up and he's really paying attention. And and then he says, can you do that again to another song? And then we proceeded to translate, you know, five songs in a row. And you but you were seemed more struck by the content and the translation than you were by the music itself. Or you could feel my being moved by the music. I, partly I could feel you're being moved. Partly I just loved and enjoyed the scene. Um, I love the process of adaptation and translation. If I could teach a class at some point in the future, it would be about adaptation where we would read a book, watch the movie based on the book, read the book again, watch the movie again. Um, perhaps like learn the history of a, a battle or a ballad or a, a love affair and then listen to the song and then watch the movie and then, you know, like, read the diary and then I love triangulating something that happened or an emotion or a thought from multiple points of view um, and I think it was also yeah there was something kind of um, lovely about the fact that this these ballads or folk songs I, I don't know have they been translated into English possibly but like it just felt like I was gaining access to a scarce resource with having an Italian in a hot tub translate these these folk songs to me and I, and I, I enjoyed your passion and you know what it of is? Of course, I'm thinking, uh, while I'm doing it, I'm thinking how much is being lost in the translation, right? Yeah, and I'm trying course. to approximate something that just can never be really communicated. But I, but I do love the essence of it, and I do hope that I can do this. I, I, I would translate. I enjoyed translating. My father was a poet, uh, and I would translate his poetry sometimes, and I love translating. I had to translate the, the Neapolitan folk songs first from Neapolitan to Italian. When I first became passionate about this music, um, there was a guy named Roberto Murolo. If you have Spotify, he's on there. He's amazing because a lot of Italian folk songs are just destroyed by cheesy overproduction with big orchestras or even worse, like, you know, 
uh, 80s like synths or something like I remember you go to Capri um, you know off of Naples and there was this one bar that they would have these three guitarists who were just singing these old folk songs and then one day they they bought like a, a synth and it just like made me so devastated that they just were like destroyed these songs with these you really should just be guitar and voice and that's it and so this guy Roberto Murolo and you can find him on Spotify now thank God he recorded 12 CDs at the time uh, I was in in high school I think and um and they went from the year 1200 to the year 1960. And, and, and Naples has this very rich, we talked about Naples having a, a rich sign language yeah. because they, they, there was a port. It was the capital of the empire of the two Sicilies, maybe. Um, my, my history is not so great, but I know that it was a very, a, a world center that people were coming from all, everywhere. And it was important to, for them to be able to communicate. And so there was, there developed this rich, you know, now kind of humorous people make fun of Italians, specifically Southern Italians for speaking so uh, 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 kind of vivaciously with their hands. And we take the, it for granted. Go ahead. The, the language region of the brain co-opted the gesture region of the brain. It makes 100 yeah. percent sense that, you know, people express themselves better and further using yeah. gesture. If you if you uh, not lesion, but just kind of like deactivate the part of the brain um, that controls language output while the person is gesticulating and speaking they will both stop gesticulating and stop speaking at the same time it's the it's the like the shadow puppetry i mean primates used to point and gestures became something that we coordinated with our movements and our incoming the incoming sounds with the movements and then it just got slowly turned into language so but i wonder why italians sense. italians are so famous for this because i mean i think it's a mixture of what so there's a guy on youtube who translates 200 gestures from neapolitan to and a lot of these might have originated in naples and again it's because it was this poor international port city and people they speculate it's because they needed to be able to communicate with people who didn't speak uh italian yeah. and and i mean of course and the dialects in italy are so so uh, diverse and even today an old roman and an old neapolitan may not understand each other uh, they're that different you know and um they're like so think as like, different as french and and, and italian so or, by, the, by that hypothesis uh china might have a lot of gestural because they have so many different languages so close and so many dialects and kind of i mean they're, i wonder they're a continent um, uh, uh, amongst themselves like but i wonder it's a mixture they, i think it's a mixture of this practical pers uh, reason and also just the italian personality which happens to be you know, very expressive, right? Mm -hmm. For lack of a better word. And so, but the, the interesting thing, watching this guy on YouTube, this old uh, Neapolitan guy translating all these uh, these gestures, is how many of the gestures I knew but had never explicitly translated in my head. It just, it just went without saying to me that this means to drink water and this means to drink alcohol. Like you say, oh, they were, that means they were really drunk, you know? Mm -hmm. But they don't want to, say it out loud so you just you say you know you might point and go like this mm -hmm. and um and then you say like Get us some water. like you could just go like this in, in a bar like if it's crowded and there's a lot of people you know it's interesting in spain for example uh there's no not much uh, culture of tipping so uh i find that table service is much much better because they hire professionals and they are not their goal is not to like kiss your ass at the end of the meal and say how was everything or to come over and at a random moment during the meal and just make the 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 performance of caring about what's happening instead they're just always have their eyes on everything happening in the room and it can be really crowded and you can just you can just like gesture over to the waiter and make the most minimal eye contact and go like this and they'll come and fill your water you know or you can just you hear all the time like people just kind of under their breaths ordering something and the waiter like 30 feet away is attentive and he knows or she knows that their job is to have that expertise you know and it's, it's quite beautiful but anyway back to the 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 gestures and the neapolitan folk songs so they um they uh, there was this rich tradition of music which was killed by television according to a lot of italians because the uh, used, people used to sing in every bar and walking down the street and everything. And then in the 50s and 60s, they started putting TVs in bars and even in restaurants. And you still see this today, like the TV just blaring the latest soccer match or or the news or whatever it is. And people stopped singing. And uh, and so 
but there is there is this very rich tradition of these folk songs that span we have records from 1200 to about 1960 and this guy roberto murolo recorded these 12 cds which i just was so moved by when i discovered them and i couldn't understand my italian is quite good but it's not as i i, I left italy when i was eight years old so i speak the italian of an eight-year-old who then would visit every summer but never had any schooling in italian right mm -hmm. so i had a lot of trouble understanding the words but then i noticed my italian friends or even my dad had equal trouble and fortunately the liner notes of these cds had translations from neapolitan dialect into italian and then i kind of integrated all of these words into i couldn't speak it but i could understand it then enough to like hear, hear it in other songs and uh and so yesterday when when the songs came on i was remembering I, I was translating from neapolitan to italian and italian to english and my a large part of my joy or maybe a small like single digit percentage part of my joy was actually watching you live revise the translation and think about the differences between some concepts or going back and be like no 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 it wasn't the star meets the moon it was the wind meets the trees or you know like going and, and, and to me that's just there's so so I I think you know this like Voyager one spacecraft that we sent out that, that yeah. uh, sent out into space and it was supposed to be our like introduction to, to uh, you know an alien introduction to us um, they sent when they sent it out they included music right I think they included Bach on there absolutely and, and yeah. uh, they, they had a picture of a man and a picture of a woman and the woman is standing slightly behind the man and she's kind of like angled up facing him and the man is out and is waving and they're both naked and the man has a penis but the woman doesn't have a vagina and so it's this thing where it's like, oh, is that the best we can do? That's the best we did. That's the best humanity did. And I imagine us sending lots of other like subsequent Voyager spacecrafts. And I think what it reveals is that the humanness inside of us is in between the, the crafts. It's not the crafts themselves. It's not the hubris or ego involved in each of them. It's what happens in between where we realize that, oh, we made a mistake with the first one. Oh, we, we reflected upon the fact that the first was not an accurate representation of us. And so the second and Voyager 3 and Voyager 5 all to Voyager 100, like getting to know someone and humanity as a whole here is someone is in the space between these acts. And so what I really like about translation and adaptation is this idea that the, that the piece itself, the art exi uh, itself, exists somewhere in the in-between. Yeah. And so there's the original song, and then there's you now, hundreds of years later, singing it in a hot tub. And the thing itself can last that long, in part because the translation means something new and different. Uh, you, you know, just, just recently, a, a colleague of mine had... Uh, sent me an email where he had read a, a 1300 poem chi uh, 1300 year old Chinese poem and had been walking around in his backyard and it reminded him of the poem and so he sent me a little email and it's like uh, the half-life of such a thing the half-life of that poem is 1300 years it's still having an artistic effect 1300 yeah. years later because of our capacity for adaptation and translation because we don't take things literally so those are the parts I love I remember someone telling me that the reason that they uh, memorize poetry as part of the like educational system now we think of like rote memorization as maybe an unnecessary part of like learning because we can just look things up so easily but this chinese person said that the, the the reason that 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 this is so such an important part of chinese education is that when you go through a difficult period in your life you know like somebody dies or or you 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 have a separation of some kind or uh, when you have these poems memorized you um they suddenly just well up in you the the important lines and they can help you like confront difficult periods in your life and yeah. i just found that so beautiful yeah that, that is that's... really beautiful that it that really is so so my, while it is true that my biggest fear in life is driving a car or actually being in the passenger seat and someone saying hey do you want a dj that's my biggest fear in life <laughs> i i there there is the possibility of artistic musical artistic experience affecting me right so the Number one artistic experience in my life has been the Russian film Leviathan. Uh, number two, I'm leaving blank for like some future, some future artistic experience that may or may not happen. Number three, though, was in Granada, Spain, flamenco dancing. And uh, the guy was tap dancing. I think that's part of flamenco. That's a normal part of it. He was singing, tap dancing, and had a guitar. And I have never seen a body move that way. I have never seen... I always knew that like the voice box and larynx was, was you know 
one of the most complicated musical instruments on the planet with the largest dynamic range and all these interesting facts but i had never seen someone's full body be turned into like a violin string it was so beautiful it was so amazing and it's there it's in number three but i but i even despite my ability to appreciate it even with my lack of ability to appreciate it the whole thing the gesture the the vision the everything was so gorgeous but it was mostly i think it seems like you i, I often marvel at the the how utterly distinct the different senses are and how each one is totally irreducible to the others so if someone had never seen before there is no way that they could deduce what it's like or be you know have someone explain what it's like to see in terms of the other senses right mm -hmm. yeah and um so it seems to me like i when we sent out when we send out this uh this record and the golden record in voyager one it seems kind of like assuming that these aliens are gonna have you know right ears that experience sound the way we do and now it's obvious that how what an assumption that is because even other humans don't yeah, have that so like you what, don't have what a tragedy if the aliens were all just me's <laughs> it's like okay Bach, like they probably next. are <laughs> and they probably are maybe they even have senses that 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 have nothing to do with any yeah, of ours they right locate and they don't care about Bach. actually their Bach has uh is you know a their version of music is a sculpture if you echolocate, right? It's yeah. you, you you fly around like a bat, you fly around a sculpture and that's the artistic musical expression. But then, and then, so it's so on the one hand, I think that that somebody obviously, a, a, a someone who's deaf, tone deaf or, or to actually deaf will never be able to appreciate music. Even if they see the beauty of somebody playing the piano and they say, wow, look at their fingers dancing around on the keys, they're missing the point, right? Um, so in the analog with with vision, I mean, there are there's a wide, wide range of ways that people see. There are people that are aphantasic that have zero visual imagery. So if they close mm -hmm. their eyes, they cannot conjure visual images at all. It's at zero. Mm -hmm. There are people that are very, very deficient. And there's some people that have, according to self-report, extremely rich internal visual lives. And I've asked a few people, like, kind of what's happening inside their head, right? Like, that's the only question I really care about. And um, one person said, like, it uh, uh, the inside of their head is like a... a like a small television a hundred feet away. That's how the memories happen mm -hmm. on the small TV, a hundred feet away. One person said it's kind of like a slide reel that comes in about one Hertz, one per second. Uh, I live mine kind of, I, I close mine and it's kind of like I'm there, but it's an extremely low fidelity yeah, version. Kind of darker but, for me. Like yeah, it's extremely definitely. dark. I, I have very few colors, but I can, I can walk through my childhood yeah. islands like fully. Right. But, but I imagine also there's no reason to believe that that range does not also exist for acoustic or internal speech or internal musical ability, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's internal imagination. I cannot close my eyes and play a song in my head. So maybe I have a fantasia, maybe I have a tonalasia or whatever the hell. <laughs> a acoustic. Beautiful place. A tonalasia. <laughs> um, and uh, my, my, my cousin Claudia had a boyfriend when I was like 10 years old named Hugues de Montalembert. And he was this amazing French man who wore, remember Back to the Future, the silver, the, the, when he yeah. uh, wears those like silver glasses when you, you see um, him, Doc coming back from the distant future. So this guy, he had been, a, he was a French painter and he was in like downtown Manhattan when it was still quite dangerous. And he was in his studio painting and these thieves came in asking him for money and he didn't have any and they got more and more frustrated. And there was a um, bucket of acid that he had been using for some uh, art piece and they threw it at his face and he instantly went completely blind oh, yeah. and he didn't want to be uh he wrote a, a, an autobiography named it called, called it eclipse and one of the best books i've read i mean i read it when i was like 14 and I st it still stays with me and i remember him saying he first of all he wore these glasses because he didn't want to be pitied and he said, if someone saw their own reflection in their uh, in in, oh. in his face, they would at first. He for, for at first he wore a black uh, kind of band as if he was going to be executed, mm -hmm. but then that was too dark. Uh, and uh, so then he started wearing these these silver glasses, which were just so he, he was such a cool dude. And he would like go swimming and skiing and do all these like things. And and in the book he describes like just going out of his apartment like a month into his blindness and walking 80 blocks to like, you know, from like downtown to like Harlem to prove that he could still do it. But the hardest thing for him was forgetting how to imagine what it was like to see. 
And he said, slowly, slowly, it became harder and harder to imagine colors and to remember what things looked like. And um, and that was the most difficult thing to let go of, which eventually it just went dark, you know, and it was dark even in his imagination at first it hadn't been. But that just even still now gives me chills like the the the, the, the immense loss that that must uh, represent, you know, yeah. he would do like practice. He would like, you know, practice uh, visualizing and uh, yeah, I can only imagine like uh, going blind and I would just I would just kind of sit and cherish my visual memories. I'm so very visual. And I mean, maybe it's a finite thing. Maybe it's a zero sum mm. game and the brain can only have so much of each sense adding up to 100. And mine is like 91 percent vision. Uh, he was I think he was 40 and he lost his sight. And then there's the famous Oliver Sacks article about the guy who gains sight for the first time when he's 40. Right? I, I wrote the update to that. Did you? I did for New Yorker. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that I read 20 years ago yeah, and it stuck with me so much because the idea that, that first of all, I remember that the senses aren't reducible one to the other. We take it for granted that if something looks and feels circular, that's because there's a similarity. But I remember like he, they would show him a circle and then have him feel a circle and show him a square and have him feel a square and, now, and then try and have the match up without having the other sense. And it was impossible, right? Yeah, that, so that's uh, Molly Noe's problem. It's like a 400 year old uh, philosophy problem, right? The Scottish philosopher, William Molly Noe. And, and I don't know it. And so it's, it's that exact idea. It's like if you had a sphere and a cube in your hand and you're blind since birth, the moment you see if you could be magically granted the gift of vision, uh, and someone else held out to you the marble in the cube, would you be able to know which was which? Would the tactile properties that you had learned about the sphere in the cube, even it's like, if, even it's interactions with the world, even the fact that like the marble rolls and the cube doesn't roll as well, and that the cube has like pointed edges and all these things, like can you can you visually infer what a pointed edge is having never seen anything ever? And so in, in 2012, 2010, um, a professor at MIT found in orphanages in India uh, kids who were teenagers who had easily fixable cataracts but had just been never, never had surgery done on them, mm -hmm. never been seen by a doctor in their lives. And he just went and did the surgery, repaired their eyes, and they could see instantly. But the question is, what does it look like when you see for the first time? And so the, the article that I wrote is called What People Cured of Blindness See. And it's just a mess. It's a complete, right. it's a complete and utter gibberish palette of senses and or colors and shapes and lights that make absolutely no sense. And actually, I just misspoke. There's, Even depth, there's, right? There's Isn't... no shapes. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally just a like an oil canvas splattered like a uh, Pollock or something. Like there's no meaning whatsoever when they first open their eyes. There is like the the question: Would you see the cube or the sphere? Is so meaningless because. They can't even see what a hand is. They can't see depth. They yeah. don't know that there's a doctor's face. They've never experienced the fact that, like, if you move around, every time we move around this room, for example, it's got, like, you know, multiple different light sources. There's outside. There's individual lights and everything. Uh, our brain is inferring the kinds of shadows and shapes that should change, the fact that the colors should change slightly as we move based on the luminance. Like, our brain is doing all of that work, and it's only doing that based on experience. And I think my, my musical inability, I never had, so my father was a jazz musician, a drummer, and but I never met him, right? Or mm -hmm. like he wasn't there. And we had zero, my mother and I had zero music in our house until I was maybe in middle school. So I went from age like zero to 10. Uh, the only music I listened to, like there was no tape recorder, no cassette player, no CD player, nothing. The only music I listened to was like background music to television. Right. For 10 years, the first 10 years, the critical period of my life. I think there must have been something in class. Mm -hmm. Right. But you don't. I'm sure I learned something in school. I think I took a music lesson here or there, like a saxophone lesson. Right. I took them. But but it meant nothing to me because I hadn't like children need to witness the joy of someone else doing something. They need to they need to watch the coordination between hands and the sound. Right. They need to they need to witness someone else's enthusiasm. And so I, I lived in this abstracted world of like pre-recorded uh, 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 pre-recorded music or just sheet music that just meant nothing. So I think I'm just like I didn't have the sensory experience in the same way these kids with cataracts. I but the fact that your mother didn't want to listen to music, maybe she had a similar genetic like whatever the opposite of a predisposition it's a is very very good point she never like there was never a concert she never said oh let's go to a, yeah a, you know let's go to the symphony or, or anything. and i noticed for example i have um terrible natural rhythm 
So when I when I um, wanted to um, play music, I was so enthralled by music already starting in the in the eighth grade. I wanted to get a guitar. I always wanted to learn to play music. I remember like going through my mom's tapes and and uh, and records and and falling in love with all sorts of music. But when I so when I picked up the guitar the first time, I was so excited. But then when I wanted to play with friends, they would say, OK, we got to play to the beat. And I couldn't do it. And and uh, and then I wanted to be in a band in high school. Nobody wanted to play with me because I couldn't play in rhythm. And and then I got into flamenco very ironically because it's got the most complex rhythm in the world but i thought okay at least i can just do this on my own and nobody has to know that my rhythm is so bad and i can just work on it by myself and when i went to spain to start studying it again i got the frustration of being the guy with bad rhythm and i would like sleep with the metronome under my pillow in the hopes of getting this in that's, you know in that's adorable <laughs> <laughs> and i would practice and and my, i remember this you know the uh, roma a guitarist who was my uh, one of my teachers he's like for you the the metronome is not a hobby it's not an option you have to like just play with it all the time and and then recently my mom got into like playing the piano and she was here and I was trying to teach her to play piano and I noticed she also has terrible terrible oh, rhythm sorry. and so I know that it's like it's in the mitochondria is it oh no I, but that's what's passed down from mother oh okay we all uh, we all have our mother's mitochondria so 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 I have learned to play in rhythm and I from years and years of playing, but it, it does not come naturally to me yeah. at all, at all. Yeah. Some people are just like kids, like you can just see them. And my dad had good rhythm. Like he played the drums and he could like, I could, I would notice when he would tap. So when you go to Spain and you hang out with the flamencos, um, everyone's, you know, clapping and often the, the, the real flamencos are like saying shh to the tourists who are there because they're all clapping off beat, you know, yeah, and it's just course. like, uh, there's a great thing on YouTube of a of a of a of a jazz pianist and everyone starts clapping to the the most boring way of clapping to the beat on like the one and the three and he decides he's going to have the audience do something more interesting and so just he just backs it up half of a of a beat is playing but because there's so much momentum in the audience they're not going to stop clapping the way they are and suddenly they're clapping synch syncopated to his music instead of and i always just like i can hear the rhythm and i love it and but i love it the way you love something that is like totally alien and hard for you to do you know versus something that you yeah. can just do naturally it makes me deeply sad that i there's this part of the world that i'm just kind of missing out on yeah, it uh, makes me sad that you're missing yeah. out on it too, because I want to share it with you. Now I want to find the things that that will at least approximate it. I'm I'm hoping that uh, I can find some of these flamenco. There are some rich, very maybe maybe I can post some some of them in the uh, in the in the description of the video. There's some real gems of flamenco dance and rhythm and music that you used to have to go. So I, I, I went to Spain in 1998, having been playing flamenco for about five years. I, I got into flamenco because two, two reasons. The main reason, my father was good friends with Keith Richards. And I was like 15 and playing electric guitar. And I was in Rome for the, my usual summer stint there. And the Rolling Stones were in town. And my dad says, oh, I got us backstage passes and then we're going to go to the hotel and hang out with Keith Richards. And to me, that was like telling you you're going to get to meet God. Right. And it was just like I, I couldn't believe my ears. Right. And so we arrive at the Excelsior Hotel in Rome. It's one of the nicest hotels. And uh, I think Mick Jagger had the whole top floor and then the other stones had like the next floor down divided between the three of them or something. Mm -hmm. Right. And we go up the elevator, we come out and then. Keith like pops his head out of the door. He's got like a one of those European style joints, fat, you know, like hashish and tobacco joints in one hand, a glass of Jack Daniels and ginger ale, his drink of choice in the other. He's got this kind of knit Rasta vest on. And uh he just like, Dado, come in, you know, and we go into the the, 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 we go into the hotel room and there's Keith Richards' father sitting in the corner. He's got like this big white beard, looks kind of like a Santa Claus kind of godlike figure and some other people milling about. There's like a really expensive sound system playing some cool jazz music and, and then there's a, a flamenco guitar in the corner. I had, you know, never, flamenco had never occurred to me and my dad says, Keith, my son's learning to play the guitar. Do you have any advice for him? 
and Keith Richards reaches over for the flamenco guitar and he says, if you want to learn to play the guitar, learn flamenco. Because if you can play flamenco, you can play anything else. It's the most, most advanced iteration of guitar playing. And of course, this is like God coming down and speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that stayed with me and I started to learn a little bit of flamenco. And then I went to, this, this was in high school, and then I went to Berkeley and Paco de Lucia, who was this, the god of flamenco music, he's the Michelangelo of flamenco, um, he uh, was playing a concert in Berkeley and I went to see it and I just was so awestruck. And in the program was a, a little ad for a local guitar mm. teacher. <laughs> I called the number and That's I never came back. Yeah, I spent uh, the next 20 years playing only flamenco. Yeah. I went to, so I, after a couple of years, I went to Spain um, I took a semester off of Berkeley. I was going to go to Spain just for a couple of weeks. And then I just fell so in love with it. I decided not to go back to school. And I fell in with these amazing uh, gypsy players, singers, guitarists. And I had this, it struck me so hard. Like the, the, when I would get to see the authentic iteration of flamenco, which A, should it, once if, if it's being recorded or they're being paid to do it, 90% of it is lost. You can get a taste of it, but it's like a shadow of it. The real flamenco happens at five in the morning when you've been waiting for, you know, drinking and all, you know, just hanging out in the bar and all the tourists have left and all of the, you know, uh, this magical moment just wells up. And there was a guy named Paco Valdepeñas who had like three teeth here and two teeth here. And he was 78 years old and he took me under his wing and he would like take me to the bar and he would and I had a little like mini DV camera and they hate being recorded, but they also have such a respect for age that if Paco told them that it was OK for me to film it, they couldn't say no. You know, like there's like the, he was the elder statesman. And so he would let me he'd say, OK, pull out the camera now, you know, and then like it'd be like 5 a.m. He'd gone to the bathroom and done like eight lines of cocaine and like I. I, I like I didn't take it partake. So then at like six or seven a.m. I'd get tired and I'd go to sleep and then I'd come back at three in the afternoon and they'd still be there hanging out and and these just magical moments of flamenco would happen and by miracle I got to film it and that was my first uh, my first documentary. It was called Flamenco: A Personal Journey, which I went and I spent. I ended up spending six months and got the the absolute just privilege and honor of getting to witness these moments now it's become a bit of a kind of cult classic in the flamenco world because at the time they used to always say like oh flamenco's dead it's not like it used to be in the you know in the old days but i knew i was living something that in in 20 years they were going to be saying that 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 was a magical moment and is this when you met the guitarists who wouldn't play if other flamenco guitarists were in the audience no so that's a famous tale that from the like 30s and 20s it's very interesting the parallels between blues and flamenco because they're both um, kind of very emotive, very rich traditions that are born out of a, like an oppressed people minority in in a culture and mixing the kind of their own roots with the the, the roots of the culture. So in Spain, you have the gypsies came originally from India and then they came uh you know, slowly through Eastern Europe, some of them through Northern Europe and some of them through North Africa. And then in Spain, they found a, a place to settle and they bring with them all of these traditions. You can hear still the Indian roots in flamenco. Mm -hmm. You can hear the North African roots. You can hear the Eastern European roots. And you can hear, very importantly, the Spanish folk tradition. And, and because the Spanish were very racist against uh, gypsies, not so much so as in other places because they did get to settle down and kind of plant roots a little, but there is still very much racism even today. Uh, they said, well, it's not a gypsy thing. It's a Spanish thing. Because if it was a gypsy thing, why isn't there flamenco anywhere else where the gypsies are? Why isn't there flamenco in North Africa? Why isn't there? So, of course, the answer is that it's it's both, right? There's, there's, and then, and then you have the same thing as you have with jazz uh, and blues where you do have white people who can play very good jazz. And you have white people who can play blues, like a Stevie Ray Vaughan is an amazing white blues guitarist, but it has a different flavor, and you have to just admit that. Like, there's no uh, Paco de Lucia is not Gypsy, um, but um, and he probably is the equivalent of I don't know uh, who's the greatest white 
jazz pianist or something but um there's a there's a different kind of personality to the music when it doesn't come from this uh deep feeling of having suffered and this was like one of the ongoing themes in my film that they're always saying that if you haven't suffered you can't play and i said and i remember saying to one of them well would you rather have suffered and play good flamenco or would you rather not have suffered and he says well look if you put my arms against the wall like that no one's going to choose to have suffered but i am glad to have been through what i've been through and be able to express it in the way that i do you know and and if you don't if you have a simple a easy life you're just not going to have that, you know? So, anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but... Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just telling my, my journey with into the flamenco world. It's kind of like... Um, there's, no, there's, no, there's no one point to the story. It's just something that influenced me so much. And then when I went back to Berkeley and studied, went back to study with Dreyfus on Heidegger and, and the whole being in the world, like, philosophy, I had this real manifestation of it to look back on and there were so many parallels which i explore in the movie um that sh you know there it, it is this kind of self-contained world that wasn't there to be discovered like it's not like the world of jazz was somewhere to be you know waiting to be discovered it was created but then then it exists as a real thing and only the people who have the skills to listen to and play this music are able to appreciate all the meaningful differences within it you know mm -hmm. anyway i could go on do forever. you want to play something in the same way that yesterday i did a reading from um i think i need to i need to prepare for that so let's 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 do that another day Great. and then but what i what i will do is i'll put some of my favorite flamenco and neapolitan uh uh, YouTube clips in the in the com in the description, and people can can listen, and then we can maybe talk about it. So the height of artistic musical impact on me, and and this is something I'd love if you could break me out of, is that would make a really good accompaniment to a radio play or a movie scene. But when I when I experience a piece of music, the best the 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 highest honor I can give it is oh that would make a really good soundtrack. Right. <laughs> And that's, I know that's deeply flawed and I know that's deeply problematic. And I, I, I wonder also, so I speak one language. Okay. Which is English. That's it. I speak zero other anything. Like I have no ability to coordinate out motor output with incoming sounds. I'm bilingual. Have I told you that? No, I no, speak no. exactly 3.14 languages. Okay. I like it. That's <laughs> good. Um, I think that's Douglas Hofstadter's. He coined it, but I realized it was true for me too. Yeah, point so one four French, <laughs> Spanish, Italian, and English. Go on. No, I just, I just want. So, so. A thing I most want to happen to people. Uh, uh, so, so basically, like humans are kind of infantilized primates. Uh, we kind of self-domesticated. This is one of the theories. Like we, we have extremely large heads. We learn for way longer than we should. We don't finish growing or developing until about twenty-five. And this is, of course, very, very unnatural in the animal kingdom right like you gotta you gotta usually you gotta deal with the exigencies of land and nature and evolution like pretty quickly but we get we have this prolonged development so we're effectively infantilized and one of the consequences of that that i like thinking about is maybe maybe there's some genetic like regulatory thing that kicks in that actually induces a second critical period later in life because because infantilization is just zooming in on the early parts of development maybe the ex total extended lifespan maybe if we ever hit to be like 150 years old or 200 a second critical period kicks in and i have long dreamed about a second critical window uh and the first thing i would do is try to learn music the first thing i would do is like absorb myself entirely i'd go to spain i'd learn flamenco i, I feel completely like solidified now like there's just i have zero ability to but I really, really would if if I if I could take a drug that would induce a new critical window. Yeah. First thing I would do is go try to learn. Before, what about other other languages? Does that do you think that, that do you think there's a relationship between the not speaking the other languages do, and I not do. appreciating the music? I think absolutely. I think a hundred percent. Why? I, well, I well I guess it's I mean it's n of one. It's anecdotal, but I just in my head like I don't hear languages as well. Like so so if I listen to a quartet, uh, I'll have friends that are musical. Uh, who are like oh my god the bass player oh my god the, the drummer and it's it's a single wash of noise to me i cannot carve out 
individual instruments, individual players, individual like yeah. acoustic layers, chords, tones, anything. There was a mathematician Just like one. this. There was a mathematician I, I heard about, and there, a bunch of other mathematicians were talking about the, the 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 relationship between and the parallels between mathematics and music. And he was getting more and more frustrated. And he goes, finally, he said, "But gentlemen, I don't understand. Mathematics is beautiful." And so he, he could see the beauty in mathematics, but not in music. And he was didn't understand how they could possibly compare the two. Most people maybe would see it the other way around. He's my grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> but fortunately, you are able to see beauty in other things. It's not it's not an inability to recognize beauty. It's just in this particular domain. Yeah, and so it's this particular sensory domain. But it, yeah. it's still deeply sad to me that I'm missing it. And it's ironic that you've got my guitars and that sculpture behind you. Have you noticed it's that sculpture? A, it's all a facade now. <laughs> look at this. Look, look behind you. Instrument. That's that's supposed to be a sculpture of music. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite place to be. <laughs> but it's it, uh, uh, it's a visual uh, manifestation of it. No, I, I get vision. Yeah, <laughs> I have that. <laughs> all right. Well, let's stop for today. Unless you have something else that you want to. No, I think I think. We should we should get Janie back on, and you guys should talk about music, and I'll I'll just be the probing inter interlocutor. Yeah, well, look, I, it's interesting. It's like trying. It's a, it's it's a form of translation in a way. Yeah, that's it. Never gets to the essence, but we can keep trying, and in trying, we can communicate something. Absolutely. That's that's what I, I I get from this conversation today. It's like this this tension that exists between the possibility and impossibility of translation. Yeah, absolutely. All right. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.